you had a practice in Sindh and you were also from a family of lawyers who practiced in that area. Are there peculiarities of the legal tradition of that area which you'd like to recount? Well, I must tell you that uh, um, Sindh had, particularly Karachi, had, had some very, very great lawyers who, if they were practicing, for example, in, in Bombay and Delhi, would have been probably at the top. One great thing that I remember is that the great Mr. Jinnah came three times to Karachi. He was engaged in some matters, appear for some clients. He never won a case in, the, in, in Sindh. Even all three times he lost the case. <laughs> And you must know something more about Mr. Jinnah. When Jinnah qualified for the bar, he came to Karachi to practice. Because Karachi had um, a, a, a community called the Khojas. And Jinnah belonged to that community and he expected that if he starts practice there, he will get a good ready-made clientele. You know, and they were all merchants and rich merchants. So he went to a firm of Hindu lawyers called Harchandra and Company. So the old Harchandra had interviewed him and said, Mr. Jinnah, you are perfectly qualified. Join. I'll certainly take you in my office. Then they had to settle the terms. And uh, Mr. Jinnah asked for 100 rupees a month. And that old Hindu miser would not go beyond 75. And the talks failed. So I have always been saying, I have said it in public meeting here at when Mr. Jaswan Singh's book on Jinnah was being released. I said, listen, Jinnah was not the cause of India's partition. The cause of India's partition was that old Hindu miser. If he had paid 25 rupees more, India would not have been partitioned. <laughs> so, so this is Mr. Jinnah's connection with Sindh. And then, you know, Jinnah was so disgusted with his, with his losing ma matters in Sindh. Uh, ultimately, there was a Khan Bahadur Khoro who was a Muslim League leader and a, and a very powerful leader in Sindh. He was accused of murder. And naturally, he turned to Mr. Jinnah to come and defend him. But Mr. Jinnah said, I won't come. He refused to come. I, I, I hope you will succeed, but I will not come. I think he had this, he had, he had realized that in Sindhi he is not going to win a case. That's it. And another great thing about Sindh you must know, and I would like other people to know. Sindh was the cradle of Sufism. Sufism is the gentlest form of Islam. It has tremendous resemblance with the Kashmiriyat of Kashmir. In fact, according to me, both are synonyms. Sindh produced one of the greatest poets. Of course, he wrote in Sindhi. But it is the opinion of experts that he was superior to Tagore and Shakespeare combined. His name was Shah Abdul Latif. We had developed such great synthesis between the two communities that as a Hindu youngster, I used to get my new clothes on Eid day and Muslim boys used to get their clothes on Deepavali day. Even when the partition took place and lakhs of people were killed in Punjab and other places, the Sindhi Muslim never killed a single Hindu. In fact, speaking for myself, um, for the sake of safety, I had sort of brought my family to, to Bombay and left them there. But I had gone back alone and I was practicing there on the day of partition or the day thereafter. And in the hope that this 
madness will come to an end very soon and uh, things will become normal. So, I stayed there till February 1948. And by that time, a large number of Muslims had come from Bihar and other places to Sindh. And uh, they were the cause of a great tension and trouble because they wanted Hindu properties. So in February one day when I was arguing a case in a magistrate's court, my Pathan Victoria driver walked in and said, Sir, you are arguing cases here and something like a fire is starting in Karachi. And the locality where you are living is in danger. So I got into his car and I wore a Jinnah cap. Nobody touched me on the way. And I found that nobody was really being hurt physically. But they had made preparations to rob all the shops, and take away all property of the Hindus, and strike a feeling of fear so that they should migrate. So that is exactly what, it, what happened. After that, Period some 15 days curfew was on and when the curfew was lifted, I decided to come to India. Incidentally, I was uh, practicing law there for nearly six years by that time. And my partner was another gentleman by the name of Mr. Brohi, Allah Baksh Brohi, a Muslim guy, but a great scholar and a very secular, uh, secular Muslim. And we were like two brothers. He was, of course, seven years older than me in age. And uh, he, seeing the incidents of February 48, and he told me, he said, Ram, I'm sorry, I now can't bear the responsibility of your safety. And then I left. And since most of the Hindu lawyers had left Karachi and Sindh, Mr. Brohi became at the top lawyer. He became a member of the Pakistan parliament. And you know that they celebrate 23rd March at the Pakistan Day. Pakistanis celebrate that. That's the day on which the first constitution of independent Pakistan came into force. That constitution was piloted through the Pakistan parliament by my ex-partner, but continuing great friend, Mr. Brohi, who by that time was one of the best lawyers in Karachi. So, I settled down in Karachi, in Bombay, where I started my practice, and with a good bit of opposition, which I encountered. I have made good, and, and frankly, today my attitude is that I, I owe everything to the help and generosity of the people of India, and I, you know, I have to return to them some date before I die. That, that's my philosophy. I think I've told you more than you expected. Yeah.